a report from Jason Shear that Florida State and Clemson could really be going to the Big 12? You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, live from SEC Media Days. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth, realignment, coaching carousel, the portal, and more. Getting you ready for the season. We've always got you covered. This episode brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. Heard from Greg Sankey, SEC Commissioner, earlier today as I record this show. We'll get to his comments and whether or not the SEC are actually staying put at 16 teams. And Alabama's been red hot on the recruiting trail. Coming up on today's show. But we start with Jason Shear of WildcatAuthority.com who has been in the media landscape for a minute. That is the kid's way of saying more than just a minute or so. There are less connected people out there, and he made some buzz yesterday when he tweeted out, yeah, Florida State, according to sources, Florida State and Clemson are expected to be in the Big 12 within the next year or so. Uh-huh? Huh? Like, speculation's one thing, but an actual reporter saying, yeah, people inside the Big 12 feel like this could actually get done, that's pretty ground-altering. I don't think this move would make any sense. For the Big 12, of course it makes sense. If you're Brett Yormark, you'd be jumping for joy. I mean, heck, ESPN and Fox might have to pay a little bit more if FSU and Clemson are in the league because they are valuable television commodities and they bring new markets to the Big 12. I mean, it it would be a landmark staple move, bigger than anything the Big 12 has done in the last couple of years. Adding the four schools from the G5 ranks was one that stabilized the conference. Getting the four schools from the Pac-12, well, there's one, Colorado, and then three came later. That was a great move. But this would be a more active poaching of schools from another conference. And to get the biggest brands, look, I would I would be shocked. I would be surprised. It would be an incredible move from the Big 12, who I'm not going to count out. Because time and again, their existence has been questioned, their ability to do move X, Y, and Z has been questioned, and they have delivered over and over again. This move would be the biggest uh, of any of those moves, but man, it, it certainly caught my attention. But the reason I don't think it would really make a lot of sense for Florida State and Clemson, unless there is another factor in play, you know, private equity raising so much money that uh, for either the Big 12 or Florida State or whoever, that the exit fees that get paid to the ACC wouldn't be a major financial hindrance on the conference, which is making the least amount of money of the Power Four leagues right now. According to uh, the New York Times and uh, ESPN, are where uh, the, uh, the these figures came from, the total ACC distribution this past year with their or from the 2022-23 season was $44.8 million. The Big 12, conversely, was $44 million in 2023. And this past year for the previous athletic season was $39.8 million. The new schools from the Group of Five ranks are, I think, all eight schools at some level, um, you know, the four school, the four former Pac-12 schools, they're not diluting the shares, but the half shares that are coming from the group of five schools, they're, they're not bringing anything net value to the league. They're bringing inventory, which of course has legitimate value, but from a media rights and revenue standpoint, are they at that level? No, they are not. And so going from a conference that pays more, is it dramatically more? No, it's not. But then where I get confused with the idea of Florida State and Clemson going over to the Big 12 financially, how is it worth going to a league that pays, that has less revenue, that pays less money, and you have to pay a bunch of money just to get there? That, that's the element of this that I don't quite understand. From a football standpoint, I do understand it. If you are just looking at which conference has a deeper lineup of conference 
championship contending teams, not just this year, but in the coming years? I think that answer lies in the Big 12. I think there, there are a lot of appealing things about the Big 12, and I've said repeatedly on this show, the Big 12 and the ACC are in a similar camp football-wise, competitively. And we're not talking basketball, just football here. They're similar. The Big 12 has a slight advantage there. If Florida State and Clemson are suddenly your headline football programs, that gap swells to make the Big 12 decisively the number three league and ensure its long-term viability through the end of this media rights deal, which runs into the 2030s. And that's when I think the next you know, massive national round of realignment will, will take off. There are, of course, you know, the Florida State and Clemson moves, and you know, there's always speculation about whether Notre Dame could eventually join a league. There's what the Pac-12 is going to do and how that affects the Mountain West. All that's going to play out just in the next couple of years. Maybe not Notre Dame, but definitely the Pac-12 Mountain West stuff. And Florida State and Clemson, is, they're going to be out of the ACC, probably not by the 25 season, but by the 26 season. If they wind up in the Big 12, you make that league so convincingly a league that is above the ACC that, that Brett Yormark would just be seen in an even stronger light than he should be right now. Because the way that he has navigated realignment, the decisions he's made, schools he's added, the you know what what he has done what he hasn't done it has all worked and do does the Big 12 need Florida State and Clemson no they don't need them but nobody needs any because you're still not going to close the gap with the SEC and the Big 10 like that gap is still going to exist even if Florida State and Clemson go and you're able to go to your television partners and say hey we have these schools with these markets and they get this sort of viewership we should now get you know, X amount more for our school. It's still not going to be anywhere near what the Big Ten and the SEC have. But it sure as heck would be above what the ACC would get. I mean, I, I would think that that value, far be it for me to be an expert in that sense, but based on following this stuff for the last couple of years and understanding the viewership and the markets that Clemson and, and Florida State bring to the table, I don't know how it doesn't increase the overall value of the Big 12's media rights contract. And then you would have ESPN likely take the early 2025 look-in clause on that ACC television contract if the rest of the league decides to, to stick together out there, Miami, North Carolina, and the like. And then they'd probably say, yeah, without Florida State and Clemson, we're not going to give you the same amount that you would have had with them in the fold. So I, I, I think this would be, I'm not breaking anything here, but this would be a pretty groundbreaking move. Jason Shear's the only one that has reported it. And I'd, I'd, be, I'd be surprised, but not shocked. I don't know that I'm shocked by anything now because of everything that has transpired in, in the last couple of years. So could be massive news for the Big 12 if they don't get these schools because certainly this will ratchet up the discussion and the excitement level and the possibility of oh my gosh is the Big 12 actually going to get Florida State and Clemson I'll reiterate as well I think their goal is going to be get into the Big 10 I'll talk about what Greg Sankey said about the prospect of adding them coming up next but if Florida State and Clemson wind up in the Big Ten, that's not a death nail for the Big 12. This would be a major added bonus, but not a requirement for survival. Greg Sankey was asked several times, including by myself and a couple other people, and then we got the sense that he was tired of answering that particular question about realignment and adding schools. And I found his answer to be more than a little bit interesting. That's coming up next. First, let's talk about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships, is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. So Greg Sankey was up first Monday at SEC Media Days. And as you might expect, I and others asked him about realignment and the landscape. And he kept going back to one line that made very clear 
the SEC is not out on expansion. If they were actively seeking to add Florida State and Clemson, if that were their number one desire, I don't know that we would get a lot of direct public comments from the commissioner about their mindset being, yeah, we want to add these schools, we're waiting for them to get out, because that tips your hand, and then if you don't wind up getting them for some reason, then the league perceptionally ends up looking like they lost somehow, even though it's the SEC, (laughs) best conference in America. So the line that he kept going back to is, we are 16 teams strong. We are 16 today, we are 16 tomorrow. That was his quote. He had other quotes, like, I'm not a recruiter. I'm focused on the 16 teams. Now, these are not answers that make you think, oh, wow, they're going to go out. They're going to aggressively pursue Florida State. They're going to lock up the state of Florida and and South Carolina. They're going to get Clemson. They're going to do. It's also decisively not a refute of the notion that they could expand. He did not say, we are not going to expand. He did not say, we will never go beyond 16 teams. He did not say, we have no interest in doing any of that. He said a a matter-of-fact statement, essentially. It was commissioner speak. It was coach speak, which leaves the door open to swing both ways. They could add Florida State and Clemson. They could not add Florida State and Clemson. And he wouldn't look like he has to go back on his statement or that he was double-talking or speaking out of the side of his mouth or anything of the sort. We are 16 teams strong. We are 16 today. We are 16 tomorrow. That was an interesting word. That was an interesting word. What does that mean to you? I was recently reading Stephen Breyer's book, The Retired Supreme Court Justice. I I read all sorts of nonfiction political books and and whatnot. And it was an interesting read. And, you know, the the book is called Reading the Constitution. And he talks a lot about, you know, the law, which is a career path I once upon a time considered. Part of the reason I was interested in reading the book and constitutional interpretation. And one thing that he he alludes to in, in the book, Retired Justice Breyer, is that he looks at what, what a statute or what a law, not just what it says, but what, is in, what it is intended to do at the time of its enactment. That guides his judicial philosophy or guided his judicial philosophy when he made rulings over the course of, uh, of his career going all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so I thought about the word tomorrow in the context of that book. Because if you take the literal interpretation, it would be, well, that means we have 16 teams today, Monday, January 15th. We're going to have 16 teams tomorrow, Tuesday, January 16th. That's what the literal interpretation of his words mean. But is that what his actual meaning is? This is not Greg Sankey's first rodeo. This is not the first time he's navigated these sorts of waters. I thought he spoke very well about the state of college athletics and navigating the the issues. I think he does an excellent job of projecting how sincere he is in wanting to make this the best situation for 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 fans for community for student athletes for everybody like that and the word tomorrow didn't appear to just mean the word tomorrow but it could and it is open-ended and he went back to it several times we are focused on our 16 teams that's the same sort of language that tony petiti used before they added oregon and washington to the big 10 i don't recall the exact quote off, off the top of my head but He said, we are focused on these members here, which is essentially the the sort of non-answer that provides cover to both allow you to talk about expansion with your presidents, and if an opportunity comes about that you feel is beneficial to your conference to then act on said move, and also allows you to not make any move whatsoever because you feel that your conference is in a good enough place. You don't want to potentially dilute uh, any revenue to your existing members, and you don't you don't want to go forward with, with making any of those sorts of move. And the comments that, that these commissioners give in these instances often allow that door to swing both ways. 
Now, Brett Yormark has had some very public and, and pointed and open remarks about, yeah, we are going, we are being aggressive. We are being shot, right? Oh, this is just over the last couple of years generally. He's been more specific with it because I think his conference has needed that sort of attitude. They've had to be on the prowl. They've had to be aggressive. Greg Sankey spoke about the regionality of, uh, of college sports in the landscape. And I asked him if he could ever see a, a world in which they needed to expand beyond their footprint because he talked about the value of still being called the SEC and that's still meaning something because they haven't extended their geographic footprint or gone outside of what the southeastern part of the United States is by adding Texas and Oklahoma. They've just really strengthened their foothold in that part of it. And he gave, you know, again, kind of a non-answer to, to my question about, you know, I'm not going to speculate about what it is, but I feel like this is something we, you know, are, are, are very proud of. But, you know, we, we feel like we're in a strong position right now. And, and they are. They are. I don't think that, I, I think it is just commissioner speak at some level, but I don't think it's just commissioner speak. Because he can actually mean that speaking as the commissioner of the SEC. Because... If, if he's, you know, committed to keeping it a regional conference, they can do that. He said, you know, uh, another one of his quotes was, we can stay at 16 teams for a long, long time. That's true because of the quality of programs and the caliber of programs that they do have in the SEC right now. They can stay there for a long, long time. But again, notice that it's not specific, which is why my takeaway was he's not shutting the idea down. He's just not aggressively pursuing it. He was very passive in the way he spoke about Florida State and Clemson. Yeah, no, we pay attention, but I'm not, you know, all in the weed. I'm not diving deep into all this sort of stuff. That might actually be the case. They definitely have an eye on it. If they feel like they could get, maybe it comes down to price and what the cost is to add Florida State and Clemson, if at all. But if they feel like it's the right move for the league, the SEC is not completely shut down for business. They might be focused on the 16 teams now until Florida State and Clemson come along. And maybe they decide, ah, yeah, no, we'd actually like to go get them. And if the SEC and the Big 12 are both bidding for, or and the Big 10, frankly, if they're all bidding for Florida State and Clemson, yeah, the SEC is probably going to win that probably going to win. The Big 12 only winds up with them if they are so dead set on leaving the ACC that they would raise hundreds of millions of dollars somehow to pay the exit fee to leave the conference and then they decide, yeah, we just don't want to be in this league so badly. We'll go to a league that that doesn't have as much revenue and is, you know, really on similar footing and isn't a massive upgrade uh, and whatnot compared to the conference that that we're in right now. Maybe they want to stick it to the ACC that badly. Maybe it's a leverage play to get the ACC to renegotiate their, their contract with ESPN or try to get ESPN to figure out how they can get more money, more revenue into the conference. Because that deal was signed so long ago, it'd probably be a little bit uh, different valuation-wise if it were put on the open market right here, right now. The ACC's media rights, I mean. So, last thing that Greg Sankey said that uh, I, I wanted to address was he, he emphasized the importance of rivalries and I touched on this a little bit on yesterday's show in the SEC ACC slate put me in the camp of I love rivalries and they are what separate college football from the NFL I'm a Seattle Seahawks fan our big rival is the 49ers I don't feel one tenth or even a fiftieth of the rivalry juice between the Seahawks and 49ers that I feel watching college rivalries that I don't even have an affiliation with. When I watch the Iron Bowl or Georgia, Florida, or just, like just keep going down the list. Oklahoma, Texas, which is now an SEC game. I, I really appreciate that Greg Sankey is emphasizing the importance of rivalries, that they've brought back Texas and Texas A&M. That's going to be a fantastic matchup. Those two fa fan bases loathe one another. It's great. It's high-quality entertainment. And leaning into that, I think, is a really, really strong play for, for, for the SEC and any college football conference. You should always lean in to your big rivalry games. Hype them up. Highlight them. Showcase them. Put them on primetime. Make them big-time matchups. That's what people are looking for. Those are the sorts of days that you don't just plan entire weeks around. You plan entire months around to make sure that you're there for the entire week. You know, tailgating days in advance with uh, your friends maybe and extending it to, you know, being, making it into a golf trip or whatever. Like, what, like the, those are the games that we're always looking for. And I love the emphasis the SEC is placing. So with regards to the schedule, 
I am fully in support of having two protected rivalries for every SEC team. I think that's a great idea because there are two teams that I can look at for a number of schools and say, yeah, you should play them every year in the SEC. Alabama, for instance, should play Auburn every year, of course, and should play Georgia every year. When you look at what those two programs have meant to the SEC in college football in the last 10 years or so, yeah, when the new schedules start coming out, like Oklahoma and Texas are going to play every year. Are you telling me that's the only team you'd like to see Texas play every year? Like either Georgia or Alabama. If you're going to have these realigned conferences, you might as well lean into let's have the big games. Let's ensure that these big games are going to take place every year. Let's start to foment a rivalry between Texas and insert you know X, Y, and Z SEC school. That should probably be Texas's other protected rival is Texas A&M. Like regionality, I'm here for it. Texas should play Texas A&M and Oklahoma every year. Oklahoma should play Texas and, you know, there isn't an as obvious one there for Oklahoma to play every year necessarily. Maybe Oklahoma fans can let me know. But uh, I, I think the leaning into rivalries is great. I think it is just a fantastic element of college football. I am here for it. And I think two protected rivalries is the right number. Speaking of Alabama and the SEC, have you seen... Have you seen how Kalen DeBoer is recruiting? Yeah, that could be a yeah, that could be a problem for everybody else. That's coming up next. Alabama red hot. You could call them crimson red hot, perhaps on the recruiting trail. That's Brian Smith, our locked on recruiting insider here at the network, brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Uh, Brian, there, there were questions, I think fair ones, about Kalen DeBoer going to Alabama and what he'd be able to do on the trail. And last time I had you on, we were talking about how much success he was having, and now he's having even more success on the recruiting trail. They have 14 commitments since early June. That's insane. That's and a lot. Also, yeah, that's that's a, that's a lot. And they have conservatively half those kids are at least borderline top 100 to top 125 kids. A handful of them could be top 25 in the nation. And the most weird part about it, for the vast majority of these players, they're out of state. Like Alabama has always been a dominant in-state recruiting program. They're they're scattered all over the country. It's California. It's Pennsylvania. It's Texas. There's no rhyme or reason with the recruiting. It is really, really bizarre. Yeah, I mean, Caleb Cunningham and Ty Haywood are the latest five-star guys to commit, a wide receiver and an offensive tackle uh, from Mississippi and Texas. And, look, I, I look at where, you know, Kalen DeBoer has been in his career. He's never been at a place that has the recruiting potential of Alabama because Washington, you can recruit at a top 20 level at Washington. Can you recruit at a top 10 level consistently? Nobody has yet, and he didn't really put a ton of effort into the, the recruiting there because he definitely did not maximize Washington's recruiting potential. He was, an, it was a coach at Fresno State. Yeah, that's not a place where you're going to pull in a top 20 recruiting class, even though it's a really good Mountain West school. He's at Indiana as an OC. Yeah, yeah again, not a big tier brand. So do you think that this is more reflective, this run of recruiting success of what he – actually is as a recruiter or is it more just the Alabama brand is is selling itself I think it's a little more of the latter uh, but he's getting a lot of offensive guys that are elite and it's easy to sell what he's done too so it's a nice combo the key is a lot of the staff that he kept has ties to wherever they want to recruit and they do their thing he's a closer he's the head coach he doesn't have to go out and do the leg which that's the typical way it works now the question would be, can he finalize on a handful of the kids that like he needs to beat Georgia for, or Clemson or Miami, some of those D linemen. That's the only thing left, like the elite D tackle kid. Everything else in the class, it's, I know it's not the traditional way to do it. He's recruited out of state even more than Saban did, but still, it's amazing. Um, I'm not sure that you're going to see anything like this from any other programs, if ever. It, it's truly amazing. Other coaches or programs, fans certainly might have looked at the DeBoer hire and thought, okay, here's an opportunity. Alabama is going to be, you know, a, a shell of itself. Or what's it going to be? Are there all these questions? I've seen Kalen DeBoer coach. He is something like 104 and 12 in the games that he has been a, a head coach. One of those losses being the national championship game against Michigan a season ago. And he, he, just, he just wins. I expect him to go into Tuscaloosa 
and win at least nine, if not 10 or 11 games this year because he has a really talented roster that he had to kind of build up, but he has done so in the transfer portal because they've brought in players and they lost guys, but they've made really good replacements. I think they've got a talented quarterback. I'm interested to see how those two mesh, but should other fans look at Alabama and think, yeah, this is going to be basically the same as it was under Nick Saban in the recruiting era, or do you think there's still a slight difference? I, I will not give him that nod because they got all the elite defensive guys they needed. When I say elite, I'm talking about guys that weigh 300 pounds that every school in the country wanted the elite of the elite. Right now they're trailing on some of those guys with Georgia. Right, Georgia's D-line class this year is going to be monumental, even by their standards, the way it's going. That's not good for anybody, Bama included. That having the point out there, everything else, it's kind of hard to argue with. The numbers are there on who they've got. They've got corners. They've got their linebacker class is really good. They do have some defensive linemen that are good players. Now it's just finishing on that offensively. It's off the charts. There's there's nothing that you can say about it. And they they still have a couple other guys on offense. By the way, they they might get it. It could be just sickening. When you look at uh, their their latest commitments, offensive tackle Ty Haywood and five star wideout Caleb Cunningham. What stands out? the most to you with those two guys specifically? A lot of fans see five stars and think instant impact, and certainly five stars tend to have that capability on average more than everybody else, but where do these guys fit into the timeline for Kalen DeBoer's program? Um, I, I would be surprised if Cunningham didn't play as a freshman. It's easier to play further away from where the ball is snapped than closer. Uh, I'm not saying Ty couldn't play at tackle, but offensive tackle in the SEC is not friendly for freshmen. They might move him inside for a year. That's something Saban used to do. But I would think he's more likely to be a guy as a sophomore. And it's not like Alabama's short on linemen. They, they've got some pretty good ones. I also think that that's kind of the, the way it works with his offense. He finds ways to get the ball to playmakers. So any freshman they bring in, Cunningham or anybody else that's good, if they show themselves able to learn the offense, that's all that's going to matter because the skills for some of these kids is ridiculous. Who, who learns the offense? That's a checkbox. The ones that do will play right away. 24-7 sports rankings have Dijon Lee as the highest ranked defensive player that they have committed in the 2025 cycle. Do you think that will be the case by the time the second national Ooh. signing day comes to a close in February? That is a great question. They, It might be because rankings changed. I've seen him play a few times. That That is an elite player. I don't know if there'll be somebody better than him. Uh, maybe somebody ranked, but it would be like two or three spots. It wouldn't be a big – like they're, they're not going to sign the number one defensive player necessarily. Again, watch out for Georgia there. But the, their defense class is still good. They just need more size. That's the only thing. Uh, elite body, sure. But uh, if Dijon Lee is your best defensive player, that's never a bad thing. Their class on 24-7 currently ranks second in the country behind only – Ohio State, who have three, what is it, three of the top five defensive back commits in in the entire country for the 2025 class. Like they are just they're 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 recruiting the heck out of out of their secondary there. But do you think Alabama could pull in the number one class in this 2025 six cycle? And what would they have to do to make that jump? They got to get one of the defensive players, another elite guy, but a Kylan Deer. And some of the kids that they're still after, that's that's the key. There's going to be another offensive player or two that they get. This will go down as one of the best offensive classes that you're going to see. Again, they got kids from Pennsylvania, California, Texas, everywhere on their offense. Mississippi, they have went after the best. They did not care where they were from, and they've gotten them. Um, getting Keon Russell, like the, the quarterback, is that's key. He just won Elite 11. They've got a trigger man that really fits what they do. So it's going to be easy to tell kids, Hey, you're going to play with this guy. So I think that will fuel them and it will come down to a very close race, Ohio state, Georgia, and Alabama. I know you're surprised by that Spencer. I know you're shocked. <laughs> um, I mean, I've, I've, I've never yeah. seen those schools recruit at this sort of level before. So it's, it's mildly surprising, but you know what? Every now and then there are flashes in the pan. There are lightning in a bottle seasons. There are anomalies and Alabama recruiting a top five. I mean, it's basically TCU making the national championship game. We won't see it again for a very, very long time, quite obviously. Brian Smith, our Lockdown Recruiting Insider here at the network, brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Brian, appreciate the time.
Thank you, sir. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.